When we decided that our last program for this month of Black History Celebration would deal with African history, only one-fourth of the problem was solved. Three-fourths of the problem included questions such as what person could do more than scratch the surface of this crucial and central part of world history, and finally, what person could bring the kind of enthusiasm to this topic that would hold your interest? Well, all arrows pointed to Egyptologist Dr. Yosef Benyekinen. Dr. Benyekinen is professor of history and Egyptology at Cornell University and professor of history at Temple University. Some of his books include Black Man of the Nile, Africa, Mother of Western Civilization, and the need for a holy Bible. Dr. Benyekinen, what do we know about Africa as the birthplace of civilization? I think most people know very little about it. However, if you look at Africa from in numerous ways in terms of the birthplace of civilization, one has to go back into archaeology, into anthropology, and then next into theology. In the case of uh, anthropology, we would have the oldest known fossil human, Zinzantipus boise, which will take us to at least 1.7 million years ago. That would mean approximately 1.7 million years before Adam and Eve. If we look into archaeology, we can go back into looking at the buildings, such as the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, the places where the uh, silk pyramids were first built, the movement of the Nile Valley in terms of the cataracts, and lastly, if we look from a theosophical point of view, we will have to go back into the teachings of the Africans and African gods and goddesses that predated Jehovah, Jesus, and Allah, and that would put us at least to the worship of Ta. P-T-A-H, subsequently the worship of Amin-Ra, A-M-E-N hyphen R-A, and goddess Hathor, H-A-T-H-O-R, whom the Greeks, whom the Hebrews rather, copied and called the golden uh, calf and the golden this and that, the other thing. Sometimes you hear people say that Africa is not only the birthplace of civilization, but the birthplace of man. Uh, would you address this, please? Certainly, the oldest known fossil man found in Europe is called Neanderthal man. And it's only dated approximately 200,000 to 400,000 years of age. The next would be, uh, they call it Pekin man, or Java man. That would be dated somewhere between 300,000 and 500,000 years old. However, the oldest known fossil man will go back to some names they have not even been able to give yet, but Ethiopian ma man fossil will go carry us back to approximately 3.5 million years. There is a Tanganyika fossil or over 2 million years, and of course, Zinzantipus boise, which is at least 1.7 million years old, meaning then that the oldest known human fossil have been unearthed, dug up, in a place called Tanganyika, in an area called Irungoro Crater and uh, Oldevoy Gorge. Now, that is it. The oldest known human has been dug up in Africa. I guess what I'm trying to, trying to get to is, you know, if, if all mankind um, uh, was born in Africa, how, how do we account for the distribution throughout, you know, throughout the world? Well, number one, there is a common land bridge between Africa, Asia, and uh, Europe. The, before the Suez Canal was dug by human beings in the 19th century, there was a land bridge there at the Sinai so that men could travel back and forth. However, the problem comes as to South America, and if you were to you, look at the landfall there, you will notice that if you push Brazil, you can push it right into Ghana and the, the Bight of Benin there. Now, that's a theory, of course. However, we do know that man adapts to natural forces. The reason the black people have woolly hair and wide nose is very obvious. 
you need that in hot climates. You, you need a lot of area to take in air where it's very hot. The woolly hair stops the sun from burning down on you. Of course, the melanin, the deepness of the melanin, also stops that propendous amount of sun rays. As you go farther north, north and you get colder, you need less air, thus less a, a smaller area for the oxygen to pass through back and forth. And you need straighter hair to stop the cold from penetrating to this. Uh, and you need less, less melanin so that we could say that man adjusted to nature. We have that in animals. If you take the egg of a wild duck, let's say, the egg will be spotty. Take that wild duck 50, 100 years, that species, and what happened within the 100 years, the egg would be less sp sp uh, spotty. Natural change of environment, man adapting to his environment. When did Africa, or as you like to call it, al Kabulan, begin to show signs of high culture? We, have, we can go back to at least a minimum of 700,000 BC. And then we are talking about the drawings in the Tassili Mountains in, of uh, Sahara. We're also talking about the civilian period, about 250,000 BC, Sibylian the first when the Africans were dealing with the uh, silk pyramids. And uh, then we come down to Sibylian the second and 25,000 BC when they started to deal with the hieroglyph. And then 6,000 BC when they started to refine, I should say 10,000 BC when they start to de deal with um, astronomy and develop the world's first calendar, the stellar calendar, and then refine that in about uh, 6,000 BC. And in 4,100 BC, they published the solar calendar with 365 and a quarter day corrected each seventh year. So that we could say that African high cultures, or civilization as Westerners would call it, goes back to at least 500,000 BC. What was the racial composition of Africa, all right, when she began to show signs of high culture? No doubt it looked like the black community in Columbia, South Carolina, or the black community in Harlem. In other words, it was black. Africa is the place where black people belong, came out of, and so forth. Of course, now a lot of people are going to claim it since the oldest uh, human being found there, the oldest civilization, and now people are realizing what they had given away and called the darkest continent. So now everybody wants to reclaim it. Now, one has to remember that when we're talking about the oldest high cultures, the oldest civilization, there is nothing older than Egypt, Nubia, Ethiopia, and um, Puanit. By the way, let me place those places. Ancient Puanit was where modern Somalia, Kenya, and Uganda. How you spell are. that? P-U-A-N-I-T. The Jews later call it Punt, P-U-N-T, huh. in the biblical writing. Then you had uh, Ethiopia, or otherwise Axum, A-X-K-H-U-M, which the Arabs uh, call Habishistan, and the Persians call Abyssinia, and also Zanzibar, and the Jews in their mythology call Kush. Well, the high culture started there with a group of people called the Twa and the Hutu, who brought down that Nile all the way from Ethiopia, and the Nile goes down north, not up. North is the low part of that area, and south is the high. So when you talk about Upper Egypt, you're talking about the southern part, and Lower Egypt is the northern part. So I want that to get clear. Okay. And the Blue Nile, the beginning of the Nile, is in Uganda. And the White Nile is in Ethiopia, and they join at a place called Khartoum in Sudan. And then they meet at the other body of water called the Akbar River, and then flow into the Kemet Sea, now called the Mediterranean. It is along that whole waterway that the indigenous Africans, you heard my term, indigenous, the people native to that land, mm -hmm. started their high cultures, building their pyramids, building their other uh, play, uh, uh, systems of worship and so forth, until they reached down to Egypt where the zenith took place, not where it began, but where it reached its zenith. And that, by that time that I'm talking about, there was no Adam and Eve yet. The story didn't exist because there was no Jew yet. Abraham wasn't born to start that story. There was no European history because Greece did not exist yet, the first of the Euro European society. There was no Chinese history because this is the year 4,700 or the year of the rooster. 
There wasn't a single society in human history in existence other than those African societies. When you begin to study African history, you invariably run into the term dynasty. What does this mean? Dynasty is a period of rule. You can equate that with uh, probably, say, the Yankees, the New York Yankees baseball team had a dynasty that won the pennant for, let's say, six straight years. Then when someone defeated them, they took over the dynasty. That's a new dynasty. A dynasty could be 100 years. It could be one day. It could be whatever it is. For example, the longest dynasty in, in Egypt was the one in which um, Ramesses II was in the 18th dynasty because he alone ruled for 66 years and died at age 90, 98. So that dynasty plus the others would make, make it the longest dynasty. They have been a dynasty for three months where the pharaoh died in three months' time and he was the only pharaoh of that name group and that dynasty went out so it's a period of rule what were some of the more significant you touched on this already achievements of the first five dynasties oh well i could say in the first dynasty the most significant thing i would say in terms of architecture and structure it was the first time that man ever built a building of stone and that was the time of imhotep uh, he was the grand vizier physician architect, et cetera, et cetera, for the pharaoh Zuza, D-J-O-S-E-R, who was the third pharaoh of the third dynasty, but there was something even more important than that. He started architecture. The building of the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, the first time that man built, placed his place uh, uh, for dying, his debt, to go to the next world above the earth. And subsequent to that, to me, which was most important, the first time man established a set of moral values. This was, now I'm talking about 2785 B.C. Before there, Christ. There was no Moses yet. Moses is not until 1346 B.C. These Africans along the Nile gave to the world something called the Negative Confessions, 42 laws in which the so-called Ten Commandments were already written. For example, it says, I have not killed man, woman, or child. I have not made light thy bushel. I have not spoken with a false tongue. This is there. Now, Moses isn't born in Africa, in Egypt, yet. This is 2785. Moses is not until 1346. And now we are hearing something about Moses getting the Ten Commandments among Sinai, the first time man had laws. Moses himself, in that book, is said to be running from the Pharaoh, meaning Ramesses II, mm. because he's supposed to have committed murder. And he didn't get the laws against murder yet, but somebody had a law against murder before Moses. And it is here, that was the most fundamental thing, a set of moral law, 42 of them, one for each gnome. There were 42 states in Egypt. Each state was called a gnome, N-O-M-E. Okay. We want to get to the, to, the, to the religious part of African history in another segment, but anyway. Um, which of the dynasties were all black? All of them, all the way up to the 13th dynasty, there was no such thing as a non-African person doing anything in any of those dynasties unless he might have been a visitor. The 13th dynasty, the first non-African people came in and conquered, smashed it. And that would be a group of people called the Hyksos from the Oxus River, which was a tributary that ran into the Tigris, which empties into the Persian Gulf, now called the Iranian Gulf. Those people came in 1675 BC, destroyed the 13th dynasty under the leadership of a man called Salatis. And subsequent to the, the Africans kicked them out under the leadership of Thutmose I. The next group of non-African people to come in there was not until the Assyrian, under the leadership of Ashurbanipal, they came in when the Ethiopians were ruling Egypt, and that would bring us to 714 with Samarkand, Pianki, and others. They were relieved, uh, then the Africans drove them out, and the Persians came under the leadership of, that was in 525, under the leadership of Cambyses. And Cambyses was replaced by Darius I. The African pushed them out, and for the first time came the Europeans, the Greeks, or Macedonian Greeks, under the leadership of Alexander, the son of Philip of Macedonia. 
That was in 332. And from that period of time to now, Africans have not ruled Egypt, but Egypt has already gone in its decline. They were followed by the Romans in 47, and replacing Cleopatra the seventh. But there were seven Cleopatras. The one that most people speak about is the last one, Cleopatra the seventh, the daughter of Ptolemy the third, the twelfth, who called himself Neosus Dionysus, which means the new Osiris. Uh, they went on until the beginning of the Christian era which brought into about what is called the Byzantine period and so forth and so forth. The Arabs came, the, the, uh, the Ottoman Turks, then come the French, the British, the Germans, everybody has walked in and did what they want. But everything you see there practically was already built by the Africans. Okay, just to give us a more detailed flavor of what African life was back, um, was like rather, in ancient times, um, would you describe um, culture in early Africa, picking one or two countries, um, so far as family, the role of the father, the role of the mother, um, that kind of thing. I think we need to go back into archaeology here because uh, we have to go back into the writings that's left. We can't make, we can't presuppose something by some spiritual divine power because it doesn't exist. We have to talk about the primary evidence and the evidence of the writing that people left because we can't go back and see them now. And the earliest drawings, hieroglyph, shows, number one, hunters uh, with um, luminaires and whatnot. Then they showed it, a later development. They showed with various tools, weapons in which to kill animals. They showed constantly the bow and so forth, and man, a man, catching an animal. And always they show a, fa a woman or Always the man had about two or three women with him. And we'll, then they would show children indicating polygamy. They also show that the women would, did all the farming mostly. The man did the hunting. They show the children doing gathering. So you could say that the family, the early family, were both, uh, was both uh, an agricultural family as well as a hunter. And of course a gatherer. But way back there, those drawings back in 250,000 indicated already a knowledge of agri agriculture because they were not only gathering, but they were also shown planting. That, that changes the whole presentation in universities of agriculture being no earlier than about 25,000 BC. Okay. How much of an impact did Africa make on Greek culture? Total. There was no Greek culture, no European culture until the Africans carried it in there. The first time, the first and oldest Greek writing we have, anybody, this university in, right here in this city, any university in the world, cannot produce to you any piece of literature written anywhere in Europe before the Greek writing. And the first of the Greek writing is Homer, Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. And in the Odyssey, Homer himself said, that even the god Zeus and Apollo, Europe's first two gods, came from Ethiopia. The first time we had, and Homer, we see him in Egypt getting his education. The first time we had to deal with the Greek. The so-called philosophers, the first Thales, T-H-A-L-E-S, we don't have him before the 600, 600 BC. From Thales down to Socrates, the three Socratian philosophies, and from Socrates down to Aristotle, we see them all in Egypt and Nubia and later Ethiopia receiving their education. The Grand Lodge of Luxor in down south, down, I should say up south in this case, over 500 miles from the coastline into Egypt, we see the, we go there at the tombs and we find all the writings, all the recordings of those pharaohs of the Middle Kingdom that preceded, there was no European history society yet, because the Greeks is the first, and we don't have Greeks until around 833, 1000 BC at best. So then when we're talking about ancient history, Greece isn't even mentioned. Now, all along there, the records show that the Greeks first arrived to receive their education. For example, we teach in the school, not we, but they teach in the school, that Hippocrates was the father of medicine. He isn't born until 333 BC. He comes to Egypt to learn medicine, to study the writings of Inhotep, who died in 2785. 
2,500 years before Hippocrates was born, Hippocrates come to learn that man's medicine and hundreds of others of his students and to learn medicine, yet goes back. And now Western writing in this university or any other university tells you that Hippocrates was the father of medicine. We have the, when the Africans produced the first calendar, which the Greeks adopted, even the present calendar that we use comes from the African calendar. In 4100 BC, the African produced what is called as the solar calendar with 365 and a quarter days, corrected each seventh year. The Greeks adopted this. But the Romans had to come back to Africa and get an Ethiopian by the name of Ekbar to even change this calendar to 365 days corrected each fourth year. Even that. The mathematics, the science, it was Euclid who left Megara, North Africa to go and taught the Greeks what is called Euclidean geometry. Uh, Lachman, whom the Greeks called Esau, left Ethiopia to go to teach the Greeks. So that as we don't care where we see the Greeks, I think that uh, Sibba Sibula said it best, out of Africa comes only gods. But that kind of information has been suppressed and not taught in the universities in the United States of America, except in now what you call black studies courses or African studies courses. And on For the People, got a question? Yes. If this is uh, if this is so, then um, my question would be, um, what then is the purpose for the distortions in history as it is taught or today? You can't say that the African people gave all these things I'm talking about and simultaneously justify slavery. You can't justify the nonsense that they're inferior. You have to take away the term darkest Africa. You would have to treat them in better thing and you would have to suppress the origin. For example, even the Western concept now of uh, university, it was the African calling himself Moore that went into Iberia and established the University of Salamanca in Spain, Europe's first university. So if you are to continue saying if you've got a Ku Klux Klan, and I don't mean the Ku Klux Klan is the only thing that's going to be racist, because the whole society is. But if, in order for you to have a Ku Klux Klan, the Ku Klux Klan can't know. It would, be, it'd be, they, they couldn't justifiably have any reason to say that black people are inferior and thus don't want to sit down any place with them. And that doesn't go for the Ku Klux Klan alone. That's in the churches, in the, in the mosque, in the, in, the, in the synagogues. You've got people who say that. Because then they will have to say that even the basis of their own religions come from there. If, if, you, if you talk about Christianity started in Egypt, you know, we forget with Pantheus and Botius. Jesus was said to be born, and this isn't Christian, this is a historical thing. Uh -huh. Jesus was said to be born in Ethiopia in a cave before the Nicene Conference, they changed it to a manger in Bethlehem. Judaism, the most prized character, Moses came from Africa, a place called Goshen in Egypt. That's what they said in their Bible. And you go all the way down. The first person in the Bible, Abraham, he comes to Africa, Egypt, to stop himself from starving to death, out in the, de based upon their own story. The whole Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all of them took their foundation in Africa. Now, if you're going to call, in, if you're going to teach all these things, the Book of the Dead preceded the Old Testament by more than 2,000 years. If you teach these things, you've got to stop practicing racism against African people. It's as simple as it is. So you've got to suppress it. Another comment, question? More comment. Um, we know it's a question. In, in terms of the, uh, the 42 laws again, um, there, there is obviously a direct parallel but in, in all of the, um, the other religions that you've mentioned. Can you be a, m a little more specific on some of the other areas that, that there's a direct connection between, say, the Ten Commandments me, and some of the things that are detailed in the 42? Let me cut in there and, and, and say that we, we will deal with um, religion okay. in, the next, in the next segment. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Can I ask a question about, <coughs> about logic? That is, um, Given um, the historical reality that you know of, would you would that suggest that 
there is a significant, significant difference in the view of the world of people who are of Western uh, European descent as opposed to people of indigenous African descent in so terms of their, 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 their system of logic. Certainly. I could even take right the term Egyptology, which I carry as a professor. There is, in reality, there is no such thing. This is what is used in the West. This Nile Valley civilization. Egyptology gives the assumption that Egypt had a, a, a unit of education that was strictly Egyptian and nobody else. That's where it reached the zenith. But this is a Nile Valley uh, educational system that developed in the center of Africa and not at the outer end in Egypt. Uh, another pers perspective is uh, what in the West, the wall is seen from the West, from Egypt, from Greece. And all that is before Greece is cut off, or Judaism, all that is cut off there. And this, again, I must say, is not a religious position. The, fact, let me give you an example. If I said that I'm Jewish, which I am, Everybody practically, most people practically, well, black people will be surprised. How can you be Jewish and be black? Because they've been sold a bill of goods that there's such a thing as a Jewish race. There's no such thing. If a man could be black, he could be Christian, he could be Muslim, he could be Buddhist. There are such things. There are more black Jews in the world today than white Jews. you got the Kashim Jews from India, the Yemenite Jews from uh, Yemen, and the Ethiopian Jews, my parents and myself, which is called Beta Israel, the Westerners call us Falasha, and we make up the majority of Judaism. We don't have the power. The white Jews from Europe and America, but then where did the white Jews, how did the white Jews became Jews? Isn't it that Judaism went up into Asia, I mean to Europe, and the vast majority of the Khazars converted into Judaism and created the bulk of white Jews? You got Jews who look like Swedes, Jews who look like Italians, Jews who look like, Jews who look like me, you, anybody else. But the myth is sold here to create a myth of a race and call it Jewish race. There's no such thing, no more than there's a Christian race. And it, that's why I'm saying people see from different perspectives. You see based upon your background. Your, uh, education is the perpetuation of a culture. That's what it is. All education in every country perpetuate the myths of that country and project even its racism. The school system was designed to perpetuate racism. That's the part of the society in which it is. Would it be accurate to, to suggest in contemporary times that a, a significant difference in the logic between Western and African uh, views of the world is that uh, Western civilization's logic can be characterized as dichotomous, a kind of either-or um, logic, as opposed to a, uh, an African logic? All-encompassing. All-encompassing. Yes, we don't have an either-or. So that's why in the... In the uh, Law of Opposites, which talks about the... We're going to have to cut you right there and come back to that question. <laughs> Sorry about that. Dr. Benyakinen, we understand that there's a difference between uh, the logic um, in the culture of Western civilization and the logic in the culture of African civilization, and that logic um, is at least in part uh, makes up world view. Could you... Um, tell us a bit about what those differences are and how they impact on the history and its difference. Well, logic in the West is compartmental, whereas logic in Africa is totalistic. Well, could, we could call it holistic. Let me give you a, a concrete example. In the West, there is separation of disciplines. In Africa, there isn't a separation of the discipline. Uh, in the West, the emphasis, like say, is for specialization within a thing. The emphasis in Africa is that you know the entire thing. Uh, there is no such thing in African thought as secular education and, and religious education. It is education. Uh, everything comes within it. Just why the ancient Africans mix medicine, law, science, engineering, magic, everything in one. So that if a man is speaking about, a doctor could say, well, I gave her X medication to solve her problem, and I spoke to her and found out one of the reasons for the problem was she was having some illusion, and I noticed that there was something not balanced with her, so 
I checked in mathematical way, I just drawing up something, mm -hmm. that everything within possibility was done to the patient because the African way is that no one thing caused the patient to go off sick, but it's a complete, if, if one thing went off, then everything went out of whack in the system that a human being will be dealing with. That one thing can't go off by itself when you're dealing with a whole human being. That if something breaks down, then you've got to check the entire thing that human beings go through. But if, but if technology requires specialization, then there could be an argument that um, to perpetuate a, a holistic frame of reference would be um, tantamount to bringing to a halt, quote, progress. Well, no, for the simple reason that I have an automobile. And uh, I know every part of that automobile. I may not be a specialist in a carburetor. But say if you're a specialist in the carburetor, but you can't put the carburetor back in the car, that's no good. I mean, it's better to have a half-working carburetor on the car moving than a perfect carburetor can't go in the car. So that the African procedure is that you must know the entire car. Now, you could specialize if you want in an area, but you must still know that entire car and know it well enough to make it operate. So that you, you must constantly remain knowing the entire thing, even though you may go over here. And that was what they're saying. If you're a specialist and the heart, you still should take patients dealing with the entire body. Would you indulge me with one, one other question related to this theme, and that is, is there a relationship then between that dichotomous logic and the uh, economic system? And the, and, and the religious systems with which are practiced in Western civilization, particularly the United States. Yes, because you see, uh, society isn't fragmented. And when it starts to fragment, it's when it starts to disintegrate. Whatever you do in one thing, you carry it through within the society. The economic system reflects the, th the philosophy of the society and is reflected by the philosophy, right? Now, the West will argue as to which dominate what. Does the economics dominate the mental thought? And I said to the contrary. Uh, the economics might, may, might, bother, might dominate the politics, but it doesn't dominate the, the, the um, eclectic thinking of the, of the West. So that whereas the West can use economics, a, a man could be a, a philanthropy, philanthropist mm -hmm. and give X amount of dollars and yet at the same time ask for the money back in taxes. He hasn't given a thing. As a matter of fact, he's gained. So that man, in the, in the, in the West, in African thought, it would not be uh, considered. If I give, then I give. I get nothing back in return so that I would have given. And, and there is the difference. So that the Western thought is to always get something, even if it doesn't material, then, like, even in the church, it says, I give to charity so that the Lord can bless me. Now, you've got to get something back. You're getting a blessing from the Lord. The African thought is, I give because I had. Mm -hmm. okay. If I can, again, okay. to, go, to take this into our, our, our immediate topic around religion, then would you, does that suggest that there is then a further relationship between monotheism, <coughs> monogamy, and capitalism? I, 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 would you say monotheism, polytheism, and capitalism? N ma, uh, I didn't you want monogamy in there? Yeah. Monotheism, monogamy. Okay. okay. <clears throat> All right. Yes. And monogamism is a German thing, as you know. The Germans developed that uh, monogamistic practice. Uh, one woman, one man. Because there's even Judeo-Christianity doesn't speak of that. All of the great, uh, according to Judaism, men had umpteen wives or, or girlfriends or women or whatever the case may be. And of course, uh, the Christians always had a numerous amount of wives. Uh, the Mormons have uh, had legally, now they don't have it legally, but they still have it in church way. So that the Germans started this monogamistic thing as if it's uh, the, the ultimate. But it is ownership, yes. Ownership is the basis of the underlying uh, thing in there. And that it comes in monogamy, it comes in uh, the um, capitalism and everything. The individual as against the society. African society, to the contrary, even children. In African society, I can whip your child if you're in that society as long as I'm an adult and that's a child. And there's nothing you can do about it. 
in African society, let's say you hit the numbers, then all of your cousins come home because you hit the number. <laughs> and do, you dare not ask, if I come and say, I'm your cousin, you can't ask me, because first of all, you can't <laughs> insult me by saying I would be lying. Mm -hmm. So anybody come in is a cousin, that means that when the night fall, you don't have any more than you had before you hit, because everybody got their share. You know, you might have a spoon more, but <laughs> since it is that it's communal property, you're a, you're a member of that family. You're not just it, the family. It's like in the West now, you, you get married and you go as far from your mother-in-law as you can. In the African community, you're not going far, far the girl isn't going far because she's going to her husband's home where her mother-in-law lives. That's just where she goes, so she, she's a part, she's a part of the extended family. Okay, of course it is, it is impossible to cover all African history in a television series, yes. okay? Um, but before we get to, to religion, would you give us your list of great African men and women? Uh, would that, I, I guess that would include African people everywhere I could think of them, and I tried to make a quick balance, and of course... Okay. I would say, I'd go back to the ancients like uh, Ramesses II, uh, who built that tremendous empire in Africa. I'd go to Inhotep, the first physician and grand vizier, and the first multi-genius in record. Uh, Hatshepsut, the first uh, woman to become a queen in history, and also a queen king, as it's called, and the woman who produced the first known uh, Planned Parenthood system called the Ebus Papyrus to regulate children, the getting of children. Uh, then I go to Makeda, one of the greatest conquerors, not using conqueror, bad or good, that, but what she did, or conquered all the way to the India. I will deal with uh, Augustine and others, St. Augustine and, and Tertullian and, and uh, uh, Cyprian, who changed the Christian religion into its modern context, Augustine in particular with his uh, doctrines, uh, um, Christian doctrines. Then I'll go to Anzinga in Congo, uh, which was Batamba really, who fought at the head of her troops for 13 long years, fought four of Europe's most powerful colonizers and defeated them all until she finally was murdered. She died in the battlefield? You died say? in the battlefield with her troops. I'll go to Queen Dahia, who stopped the Arabs in North Africa in a similar manner as uh, Anzinga and others. Then I'll come, that's, I mean I'm being fast, I'll come to the United States of America, I'll go to, well, Harriet Tubman, uh, who went then saved countless Africans from the ravages of uh, slavery. Sojourner Truth, who with no education at all, totally illiterate, ending that way, becoming a tremendous spokesman, one of the greatest orators of her time, Henry Highland Garnet, one of the great writers, and of course, Frederick Douglass and uh, David Walker in terms of writing and protest movement. In terms of fighting for African people, I can't forget Nat Turner, Denmark, Vesey, Prasco, and others, heroes in every sense of the word. I've come in modern time with uh, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and I do not make distinction between them. Oh, Du Bois, Garvey. Oh, I can't forget that little woman who refused to get up off the bus, uh, Rosa Parks Park. and mm -hmm. others. And then I'll go down in the Caribbean and pick up a woman they call Queen Mary Bottom Belly and I am Ellen Fireburn, three women who fought against Denmark, England, Spain, and Holland, and for seven years looking for independence. I'll take Buckman, Buckman, Neg Yosef, and Mackendall, mm -hmm. the people who started the French, the Haitian Revolution before Toussaint Liverpool got into it. And Toussaint, of course, and Christopher. Oh, I'll look at the Maroons in Jamaica who fought and took away Jamaica one time from the British and forced the British into treaty. I, I can think of so many more. Booker T. Washington, you know, people play him cheap, but. Tuskegee Institute was not a slouch, and still isn't. And I look at Carver, who changed the entire South. You know, people think of Carver just, he did something with some peanuts, but Carver made the indolent South, I use that word, indolent South, mm -hmm. remove it from its lethargy and put it into economic viability. 
so it can compete with the industrial north. Change the entire south, that one black man. I look at, uh, oh, Angela Davis, I, for her struggle, making no qualifications, her struggle. I would look at, uh, I said Du Bois already, I, I would look at um, Rap Brung and Stokely Carl Michael, Adam Powell, for their struggles. These are people that made major changes in our history. It's not a whether or not even I agree with them, but they did and made masses of people move. Dr. Stokely Carl Michael and so forth. You see, I'm crossing lines. And uh, Father Divine, Daddy Grace, they made million. And Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad changed the lives of hundreds of thousands of black men, women, and children. And so I could go on and go on if time had permitted. All right. Uh, another day. But let me, <laughs> let, let, let me ask you this. You mentioned um, Queen Anne and Zinger yes. and the fact that she fought, I guess, the Portuguese for so many years right. and some other um, um, African women. Mm -hmm. uh, what should this say to us about the role of black women today? Well, you're talking about God now. When you said black woman, you said <laughs> God. Uh -huh. Black woman give birth to me. Uh -huh. That's God. Uh -huh. Heaven is the place I stood 10 months before coming out like I am. That's the actual God and the actual heaven that I know. Anything else is my belief. You hit a black woman child and you got a revolutionist. You don't have to train a black mother. Don't waste time training black mothers. Train her child. Because if you hit the child, she's going to join whatever his revolution is. A black woman saved black men. There was a time when we couldn't walk straight. You couldn't, this TV place would have never watch you in the door. You couldn't enter the door at one time. You know it, you know, and I know it. A little people tore up some buildings and you're in the door. That don't mean you're going to be in the door forever. Uh, but. That little black woman, Rosa Parks, is what I'm talking about. It's, it's, a, it's really what I'm talking about. It's Martin Luther King's mother that forced him into the movement, you know. Martin returned it down twice. But old Mrs. King said, get out there. I didn't send you up there to be on a holiday. Get see, out there, Junior. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh -huh. You see, uh -huh. when black men had to go to the field, it is that black mama that told her daughter, now you got to go to college and teach your brother in the night. So the black woman have taken the burden when the time was necessary. She's never backed up. And now when the black man getting money and deserting her, she still don't desert her children. So I got nothing but praise for her. Mm -hmm. okay. See, one was my mother, one is my wife, not, six of them are my daughters, and I got umpteen granddaughters. Not that, com not that comparison is necessary, but yeah. okay, just for the purpose of, 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 of instructing. Um, how would you say black women okay, fit into this current women's lib thing? Um, she doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. Black women don't need to be liberated from her man. I mean, she doesn't need liberation in terms of work. You see, the liberation woman uh, said that she has not been fulfilled in the work area. Man, black women have not, black women have had to work morning, noon, and night. I mean, most of the time she's had to carry the household. And today when the black man catching hell and got to run, she's got to take care of the family. So for her to talk about the women, the women's liberation movement is a movement where women feel that they're not fulfilled. But no, black women is fill, fill over, overfilled. So she doesn't need to go into that thing. That thing is for women who frustrated but men. And I'm, and I'm sure that the black woman isn't frustrated with her man yet. And I hope she never get to that point. So it will damage her. I mean, what black woman, here they tell you, I don't need a man to help me cross the street. I, I hope black women ain't that stupid. If I was a black woman, a man want to help me through the street, that's extra help I got. And if you want to buy my food in the restaurant, that's money, I got more money in the bank. I hope I'm appealing to all black women not to let that nonsense to get mess them up. That's a, see, a job is a different thing. If a black woman is a TV, working in a TV studio like you, 
She has a right to get the same salary doing the same job. Nobody's talking about that. But when you're talking about, you know, you got to liberate for yourself from your man. You've got a big fight with the man, and I'm the same like the man. Well, then we should go in the same toilet at the same time. We should go use the same underwears, you know, with the frittles and so forth. You know, let's, let's put it down where it is. I guess my question is, uh, really was, uh, historically, uh, what differences do you see between uh, the kinds of role white women have played and the kinds of roles black women have played? totally two different roles altogether. White women have been up there on the top with her man. It's just that he has kept her down one notch, but she's still over the black woman. She's over the black man. And the black man had been over the black woman in status. But the point is this, that historically, now what they have been doing is that they now could use the black woman to club the black woman, the, the, the white woman. Because if you hire a black woman, you also got a minority and you got, oh, so that the white woman can't get the job either. So you, you satisfy two different things with the black woman now. So that they're using us the club in the reverse. And uh, uh, all of these different kinds of things. Okay, let's, let's get back to, uh, you got, okay. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I've got a question relative to religion, getting back to the su subject of religion. Well, well let, me, let, me, let me just, let me, let me cut you a minute. Let me cut you a minute. <laughs> okay. Okay, for many people, the relationship between Arabs and Africans is confusing. Would you give us uh, an historical view of the relationship between the Arabs and Africans? The Arabs came to Africa, no doubt, as slave masters even before the Europeans came in 640 with the jihads. The Africans know that history. The Africans aren't stupid about it. The Europeans came in 1506 as slave masters. But what has happened since that time to now is that the Arabs were equally colonized, like the Africans, by the same colonizers. Now, the Arabs then and the Africans found it mutual to their benefit for coalition with each other because they have a common enemy. Their previous colonial masters that just leaving and there's neo-colonialism still going on, is the Westerner, whether he's Christian, uh, Jewish, uh, atheist or what? He is a Westerner that have just had both of them in colonial uh, con uh, uh, holding. So that the coalition being made by the Africans and the Arabs, the Africans isn't stupid to know that the Arabs are still controlling North Africa as a conqueror. But for the time being, the Africans is going to deal with him eventually on that issue. But they both have to deal with the European as the conqueror because he's the, he's the prevailing conqueror. If a man got a pen knife to my throat, and another man is coming with a machine gun two blocks away. I'm dealing with a pen knife. It's right up against my throat. And maybe the machine gun may jam. But you see, I got to get the pen knife away before I could deal with the machine gun. First thing first. And so the Africans have no choice but to deal with the Arabs as a better friend than he could deal with the West right now. OK. Yeah. Aside from the, the status of, of conqueror and conquering, what, uh, what are some of the reasons for the, the so-called appeal of, uh, and the spread of Islam in, 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 in some of the African countries? Well, the spread of Islam will go, go on now because the frustration of European Christianity, the lies that the missionaries brought, the behavior of the missionaries as missionaries, uh, the missionaries coming with forked tongue, First of all, saying that they had a different Christianity when Christianity came from a Africa and Asia with uh, Pantheus and Boethius. The whole Jesus had never been in Europe once. He was in Africa and Asia. That's where you teach according to even Christian teachings. And all of these, the, the fact that Christianity had been aligned with the colonial powers and still is aligned. Uh, Christianity is what motivates South Africa. They're Calvinists. Huh? And... Uh, Judaism in South Africa, the Jews of South Africa are no different in behaving than the Christians in South Africa. They don't behave as Jews or Christians, they behave as whites. So that the hypocrisy of Christianity in Africa has made many Africans go over to try Islam since Islam is a power force. They're not joining Islam for love, but you're joining for a power force. Islam equally represents oil. 
It, it, you, you get what I'm saying? You, you, see, I, we're not talking about love affair with religion. See, religion is a tool. And it, instead of, the Africans realize you've got to use religion rather than let it use you. So that the new power base, religiously, is no longer Christianity, which the Africans had to join if you want to eat, because the missionaries won't let me eat. Since, since capitalism and Christianity was the same thing in West Africa as Islam and Christianity, I, I mean, power is the same in East Africa and in North Africa. And that's the, the whole fact. You see, people want to mess. Religion is something pure dropping out the sky. Religion is made by men, what is, to use by men. What, what is a traditional African religion? Oh, they got all kinds. Uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are outgrowth of the traditional African religion. But what you probably mean is like the Yoruba religion oh. from West Africa with the god Ulu Damari, the, uh, the Kenyan, the, the, what you call it, Agikuyu religion with the god Ngai, the South African religion with the god Unkulunkulu, the West African religion with the god Vodum, and so that the, and these are religions with millions upon millions of followers. Just as good as Christianity, Islam, or Judaism. There's no such thing as a bad religion and a good religion. There's no such thing as a good God and a bad God. All gods are the same for the people who use that God. Okay. Could you tell me, in terms of a Western Christian religion, uh, it speaks of a gap in, in its history uh, in, in the life of Christ between the age of 12 and age 30. Can you tell me, do you know anything about what happened during that interim period? Yes, you can read the Aquarian Gospel. And it gives you the life of Jesus from age 12 to 30, to 30, 30, 33. The reason that, that book, those books got lost, they cut out the sex life of Jesus, his role with Martha, his girlfriend, and Magdalene. They cut out uh, his normal life. And you could also find the, 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 the 18 books that were taken out of the Bible, the so-called lost books of the Bible. They're not lost. You could get them from World Publishing Company. But there's another thing they had to do. The story of Jesus is a second-hand story. There's a story that the Africans of Egypt and Ethiopia and Nubia had of Isis who became pregnant by an immaculate conception, gave birth to her child, uh, Horus, by a virgin birth 4,000 years before the Mary Jesus story. It's nothing but a copy. This thing, you can go to right now to... As a matter of fact, you can go in the Book of the Dead, you can go in the Gods of Osiris, uh, uh, thing, Os uh, there's a book called Isis and Osiris. You can go to the Temple of uh, Edfu, in, um, uh, it's called the Temple of Horus at Edfu in Egypt, and see it. You could go to the Temple of Setaiwan in Abydos, and it's all over the world, walls. This thing about Jesus is nothing new. Jesus is a copy of Horus. Everything said for Horus is said for Jesus. And it's 4,000 years. Let me just give you the Roman Catholic version. And they worshiped Mary before they worshiped Jesus. It was at the Nicene Conference that they stopped worshiping Mary and then worship her son. What, did it says, what, about, what about the Nicene Conference? The Nicene what Conference was in 323 when Constantine, the Roman emperor, ordered 219 bishops to a place called Nicaea to discuss. They were arguing against each other, killing each other, literally killing each other. And at that conference, they killed a bishop by the name of Athenesius, who refused to accept any virgin birth thing. It, the Roman Catholics still say the thing they used to say about Isis, Holy Mary, Mother of God, blessed are the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Now, if you look at Isis and Horus, you see Osiris mating with a hawk, which carries the sperm into Isis to create the, the, the immaculate conception. The Christians got a, a, a same bird called an angel who take it from God, Jehovah, and carry it into, Isis, uh, into Mary. Same story, change the names. Uh, but you can't say this because these men, if, if they went to the, to the seminary, they know it, and they hypocritically tell the people in the seat in the congregation another thing. It's a ripoff on Saturdays and Sundays. That's all it is. But this is not something that you're just creating. There's I, I didn't write these. Uh -huh. they, look, I could tell you where to go see the, the works. I just tell you the oldest nation is in there, the temples. It, these things are in the temples in Egypt. 
You can get them in any good bookstore like Brentano's in New York. I don't know how good the bookstores here are, so I can't tell you about those. But you can go to Brentano, you could go to uh, um, Double Day, you can go to Barnes and Nobles in New York, or you could go to a place called Wisner Bookstore and get these books. You can get the Osiris, the God of the, uh, Resurrection, you could get the Book of the Dead. These are translated. Now, the original work is in hieroglyph, and, you, and then you see the English translation. Or if you've got a, a, a little bit of money, you can go on one of the tours in the summer or, or whatnot to Egypt and go into these temples, go into these tombs, and see the whole thing written there, plus pictures of the whole thing. And anybody that says that he has done his whole work, is, the saddest thing is to be in Egypt and see some people coming, going to Bethlehem, say they're going to the Holy Land, and to go to see the pyramids that the Jews built, and they didn't build one of those that they're looking at, because the pyramids that they go to look at are the, step, are the three pyramids at Giza, and all of those pyramids was built before the first Jew was born. Thank you. We'll come back again next week. Dr. Benyekinen, thank you. And that's our program for now.